Addiction has always been very, very difficult to understand in terms of uh, the sort of social and psychological aspects. I think increasingly we're understanding now that addiction is a genuine medical condition that has uh, a neurological basis that we're trying to understand. No other country on earth has poker machines in every corner, in bars, in clubs, in pubs, you know, places where people go to congregate. What we also see as a consequence of that is elevated rates of all sorts of problems. So that includes poverty of children, neglect of children, physical violence against intimate partners, lots of crime. A lot of Australian parents um, have well-intended behaviours which they don't realise are actually sending the wrong message to their child. Parents think that by providing their young person at home with a sip of their wine at the dining table, that's a good way to introduce alcohol and to teach them to drink responsibly. I think for some people food is an addiction. Addiction centres in your brain sit very, very close to your appetite centres. And so there is a real crossover between addiction and this disease state. And if food is what it is that you turn to in that situation, if that's the way you're wired, then it's very difficult because you're surrounded by food every day. I think there are probably many, many pathways of why individuals come to addiction. From a a scientific perspective, often a lot of those things that we do in the environment that affect us, they tend to change one of a few systems that we have in terms of our psychology and our brain. I started drinking at 13 and I, I just fell for it like a lemming off a cliff. It was quite fetishistic, really. I remember um, going to my dad's drinks cabinet and the sounds that the bottles would make, the heavy bottles as you scrape them off the shelf and the smell of the wood and the varnish. Um, and it was, it was very available to me because my dad's quite a heavy drinker, so I thought he's never gonna notice. If they only realised um, that, that their behaviours are inadvertently reinforcing that alcohol use is fine to their child. So that's what I'm hoping, that, um, that the response in, as, as a nation, um, beyond changes in tax, changes in you know, alcohol costs um, and charges associated, is actually at the individual family level, equipping the community with the, the strategies and, and the tips that, that are required to tackle this issue earlier on. There came a point where I realised this just can't go on anymore. Um, and in the run up to that point, in the years running up to it, I would think to myself, you really need to stop drinking. But it wasn't a serious thing because I thought, how can you? How does anyone, how do you shape your life without alcohol in it? It just seems ridiculous. I think it's very clear that research supports the notion that these patients have actually been susceptible to a transition in their brain that essentially um, goes from behavior of choice to a habitual behaviour that, you know, they have much less control over. A key part of some of the studies that we're doing here in collaboration with the University of Melbourne is to understand some of the neurological substrates that happen as a person becomes addicted to either alcohol or uh, other drugs of abuse and see those transitions that happen in the brain and find ways that we can intervene therapeutically to prevent those from happening. In our most recent research, we have an animal model of a, a rat which becomes addicted to alcohol over a period of time. And we can look at the potential testing of various uh, different drugs to see whether they will reduce uh, the, essentially the self-administration of alcohol. 
We feel that this research has the potential to revolutionize the way that we treat alcohol and other substance use disorders. If I could talk to my 13-year-old self, I would press upon her the fact that it's okay to seek professional help. I just can't emphasize that enough. I didn't go and see a professional until I was 30. Um, and I was dealing with a lot on my own. I suppose that women in particular tell ourselves that our problems aren't important enough to seek help. And that was certainly the case for me. Turning Point's a National Addiction Treatment Research and Training Centre. Every year we have over 100,000 people call our helplines. We have half a million people come through our online services. Around six to 7,000 people actually seeking counselling online with our counsellors 24-7. And we have about 5,500 people coming through our clinical services. The treatment does work. People have really good outcomes, in fact, better outcomes than for other chronic health conditions such as heart disease and asthma. Brain Park's going to be, it's going to drive your curiosity. It's going to be a little bit like a, a museum that meets a science lab, that meets a technology space and a clinic all in the one place. There's billions of dollars going into investment in VR and we see that as a part of the future of being able to do digital therapies. We can't send someone into a casino geared up with all these experimental equipment and measure everything, but virtual reality enables us to measure what's happening in real time, in the office, but also in a safe way. You actually get them to do it and you measure uh, their physiology, their psychology, their behavior in real time. Our research is specifically interested in two main areas, let's say. One is to try to understand what are the thinking and brain drivers of addictive behavior. The link between addiction and obesity relates to the fact that for some people with excess weight and excessive eating characteristics, some of their eating behavior is driven by strong cravings uh, for certain types of food, by some problems to control uh, the intake of that food. Once you've gained weight, only about 3% of people can lose a substantial amount of weight and keep it off. 97% of people can lose weight on a diet, but 97% of people will put that weight back on, and that's because your weight is a very biological thing. Well, by understanding that uh, the preference for certain types of food and the control of intake of those foods is underpinned by mechanisms that are somehow similar to the ones that uh, underpin addictive behavior, I think it's a promising avenue, for example, to uh, help people in a better way to be able to uh, control their eating uh, more efficiently. There's 28% of the population's obese. I can't operate on all of them and nor can my colleagues. We need a treatment that's effective and can be delivered safely across that large number of people. What we're looking at is whether or not e-cigarettes help people to quit smoking. There's been a, a lot of controversy around e-cigarettes, and I suppose in some ways we need more evidence about whether or not e-cigarettes are an effective mean to get people to quit smoking compared to our alternatives. In this trial, we're kind of exploring the quitting aspect, and we need a lot more long-term evidence to work out how harmful are e-cigarettes themselves. The tobacco industry appeared to be invincible 50 years ago. Now, it took a long time and a lot of work by a lot of researchers in the public health sphere, but eventually we learnt the tricks of their trade, we learnt how they do what they do. One of the key areas in which the gambling industry influences policy is by having a stranglehold on some gambling researchers. So some of the world's leading gambling researchers, including a number of Australians, are very closely linked to the gambling industry. Now, all of these tricks we know have been you know, undertaken in the past by the tobacco industry, by the alcohol industry still, and the gambling industry is continuing in that tradition. We've been trying to unpack how the machines work, how they do what they do, why they are so successful at getting people addicted. Of course, the industry has not been very good at sharing that sort of knowledge. So I ended up being able to buy a machine because a generous benefactor provided us with a donation. 
we've now been able to produce a report for the Australian government's gambling research centre which outlines how uh, machines work, what we call the structural characteristics of them, and if we know how they work, we're in a good position where we can say, well, this feature shouldn't occur because it unnecessarily adds to the addictive potential of the machine. This is often uh, almost a decade or longer from when somebody starts developing problems with alcohol and drugs or gambling before they seek help, and that's an awful long time. And the reason people aren't seeking help is because First of all, they don't believe that it's a real issue, so there's a big community concern around it not being real. There is an opportunity here for us to change this community conversation and to really think about how we can address this stigma to ensure that people get help early by learning from those other examples in medicine, such as cancer and depression.